And thanks, Rick, and everyone for having me at the um, web meetup tonight. For most of us in this room, the year 1993 is incredibly important. In some ways, it could be seen as the most important year of our working lives, even though, for most of us anyway, it happened some time before our first job. An advertisement appeared, advising people to Telnet to a particular IP address. And once they did, the first ever web page would load in the first ever web browser. Now, given that we're in Australia and in 1993 the internet was, well, a little bit 1993, um, it would have probably would have taken longer than in my little animation for the web page to load. But for the locals who access it at the time, it eventually loaded. Maybe took six or seven seconds, but, you know, that's pure speculation. It's all pretty basic, but it's the web. At the top, we've got a heading for um, semantic HTML, and we've also got links in the um, text. You know, links, the thing that makes the very the web, webby. If we jump forward almost 22 years to the day, we've started to discover, the, or we're well aware of the limitations of the original HTTP specification. So eight years after the project began, the HTTP2 RFC is finalised. There had been practical uh, variations of the spec for a while, so the standard was pretty rapidly adopted. In fact, by the time the HTTP archive started measuring HTTP usage in 2016, just about 12 months after it was first um, finalised, over one in six sites they measured were already using it. And we all got a little bit excited. The sun was shining, the horses running in the field, the hens were laying. For web developers everywhere, the web was to become a happy place full of highly performant websites. Immediately, all our performance issues were solved. After years of getting slower, the web started getting faster. And now, all our web pages are visually complete a, six full, a full six seconds before we know that we even want them. <laughs> and we live in a utopia. <laughs> of course, we all know that it went a little bit animal farm. <laughs> I called this talk HTTP2 Redux because I wanted to evoke the idea of the bad movie sequel. <laughs> I was specifically thinking of Speed 2, which is set on a cruise ship and is from all reports a terrible, terrible, terrible film. <laughs> At the end of the film, the producers spent $25 million crashing a cruise ship into an island. And I kind of think that that's what we've done as web developers. We've taken something very expensive to develop that took a lot of people a long time to build and we crashed it into an island. Let's take a look at some of the actual statistics available for time to visually complete over the last five years. Rather than the mean, the HTTP archive report median averages, so that's what I have here. And if you squint, I guess, the timings kind of do improve with the introduction of HTTP2, but really by now any advantage has been lost. And to be honest, I reckon that the um, most significant change in this graph has more to do with the HTTP archive changing their uh, testing device from an iPhone 4 to an emulated Android Chrome browser at around the same time that HTTP 2 was released. Now, all the stats I'm showing today come from the HTTP archive's mobile reports. In part, it's because these reports contain substantially more data than the desktop um, reports do. In part, it's because mobile has taken over desktop as the way people browse the web today. And I also think it could be a reflection of where I work. I work on the CMS squad for the... Um, I work on the CMS squad for the product technology team for The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald and The Fin Review. Back at around the time the HTTP2 spec was finalised, the then Fairfax Media set out with a lofty goal 
to rebuild their entire stack right through from CMS to the various presentation layers. I wasn't an employee back then, but set out on the ride with them, working on the CMS in a client services role at my previous employee. And around 10 months after we started, the Brisbane Times was relaunched. And from CMS right through to render layer, a bunch of proprietary code was replaced with systems built on open source. And rather slow than slowly upgrade their website over the course of a few months, the team launched a new design, upgraded to SSL by default, and enabled HTTP2 all with the flick of a switch. And back then, HTTP2 still had its shine. A lot of people were very excited. Idiots. I got very excited standing in front of groups like yourselves telling people that Utopia was coming. And I don't necessarily think that that promise of Utopia was wrong. I just think that we, as web developers, took advantage of a new protocol and the natural improvements to the way the web worked, and we spent it. However, there is some good news. I do have a graph that shows an ever so slight improvement over the last few years. We've just got to wait for it to load. <laughs> I guess I'll have to describe it. We can't sit around all day waiting. It's not much of an improvement so much as at least staying steady for the last four years. And that is time to first contentful paint. First contentful paint is the moment anything actually renders on the screen. It can be a canvas as long as it's not plain white or a gray block to indicate that an avatar may be loading in that place. Really, it may as well be a single poop emoji. In 2014, it was moving upwards to about the six or seven second mark, but there was um, a slight trend downwards for a few years. It's a completely symbolic improvement, but it's an improvement. However, in the last few years, even the symbolic improvement has been lost and first contentful paint has started going upwards. It's almost like people have stopped even pretending that they care about performance. But users don't really care about being able to see something that pretends to be useful. So since 2017, some more meaningful stats have been available. First, meaningful paint. Still looks pretty good, slower, but not a great deal. And then time to interactive. You know, that moment you can actually move the page, read the article, click the links, get a response to your actions within a reasonable time frame, being um, defined as 50 milliseconds. And, you know, use the web. And do we have some good news? I think we might. Let's look at that again. As a metric, Times Interactive was introduced in June 2017. That's why it's missing from the start of the graph here. But I know that that's not what's interesting about this graph. It's just a cool story. Something clearly happened in these two months here. Looking at the difference month to month, in July 2018, the median dropped 14%, and then in August 2018, the median dropped a further 25% which is obviously not true. We've all used the web. We were all using it in July and August 2018. What happened was that the number of uh, sites in the data set changed somewhat. And by somewhat, I mean it roughly tripled. And then tripled again a few months later and jumped by around 20% a, few, a couple of months after that, just for good measure. The HTTP archive currently includes half a billion sites. That's half a new billion, not half an old billion. So I mean about 500 million sites. Now this graph says to me a few things. More obvious being that the more data you have, the most more accurate your averages. But really, I could be standing up here telling you whatever story I wanted. Just look at the difference between median and mean. But really what it says is the most important thing is that the most meaningful stats come from measuring your own site, which is what I've been doing. I have an ego. I'm standing in front of you. I have an ego site. 
So I've been running stats on it since the start of the year. The bottom line is time to visually complete and the top line is time to fully load it. I don't gather all sorts of ridiculous stats on it. It's an ego site that sometimes gets up to a dozen visitors a day. If I blog, maybe it would get more and I might need to worry more. But without, paying any, um, without even paying full attention to um, the full set of stats available, it's still useful to have. It's fairly clear, for example, where I messed up the settings on my CDN and stopped serving GZIP content for a month or so. And there are services that will help you measure it, but for my so site, I'm just recording the data in a spreadsheet. Just the basic facts. I'm not recording a full set of metrics, but or to set up a few more because they're quite easy to get. And I'm certainly not running the full Lighthouse test suite on it. Um, it's, I've discovered that it's quite possible to tie up a web page test instance for um, a number of hours if you do that too many times. I just copied a spreadsheet that had been shared by the Chrome developer relations team. My point to all this is that you've got to measure on your own stats on your own sites that you're building. And if I had to guess, looking around the room, I'm not the only person in this room working on a large site. You know, we go into our fancy city building and work on our large sites. The business department comes in and discusses a business need, and you end up putting just a little bit more JavaScript um, into the website. The folks at Akamai recently did a study and um, did some analysis of what can happen if you just blindly follow business rules with regard to JavaScript. They compared the amount of JavaScript on a page to the effect on its performance. On a slow connection, each 100k of JavaScript adds a few seconds until the page becomes interactive. I'm sorry if I'm coming across as a little bit ranty. I will confess, I'm not wrapped with the state of the web, but I don't think it sits solely on web developers. And when I'm talking about web developers, I firmly include myself in the list of people who mess things up on the web. But there are also some ancient network-based issues that come into play. And in many ways, the next improvements to HTTP can't come quick enough. With HTTP2, when you make a connection to the uh, web server, a multi -connect, uh, multiplex connection is made over a single TCP connection. And that means that if um, there are connection problems between your phone and the server, then the entire connection, exp connection explodes. It can be caused by a number of things. The connection completely fails when the NBN goes down and your phone has to switch to 4G, in which case you get a new IP address in the process. Or it could just be a quick hiccup as you're changing towers travelling on the train from one tower to the other, in which case your IP address may not change at all. HTTP3 which will change that. Instead of using um, TCP, it uses the QUIC protocol, which runs over UDP. Unlike TCP, UDP kind of spits out a bunch of requests without waiting for a response. And these requests aren't auto-dependent, and the server can respond to them independently. They don't even need to travel over the same route. The server can spit out its responses, and again, using UDP, the server doesn't wait for a response, it just sort of hopes it gets there. It's kind of like the difference between sending a letter via regular mail and registered post. Quick takes these UDP connections and adds a protocol layer on top of that to turn them into the equivalent of a TCP connection. The server and the browser can acknowledge um, each other and what's been sent and received while being able to take advantage of UDP. It does this through a very complex system known as network engineer magic. <laughs> the advantage though that this offers is that when a single connection fails, the overall connection to the web server will remain up. In a way you get to take advantage of the single advantage HTTP one had with its multiple connections over HTTP2. 
HTTP3 is the new shiny, but there are practical uh, and there are practical implica um, implementations behind flags in browsers, and Cloudflare are beginning to allow users to set up it up on their sites too. But like any new technology, once it comes time to use it, there are going to be practical implications and difficulties. Jake Archibald has written about some of um, the problems he discovered working with HTTP2. But when we hit these hiccups, um, it's easy to forget about, or worse, just spend the new advantages a new technology offices. But we're all in this room today because back in the 90s, a bunch of people saw the promise of HTTP um, and the promise and the web and stuck with it. As HTTP3 gains traction and its advantages become apparent, um, I'm asking you to again to uh, look for the positives and look for the promise, not the problems. Thank you very much. <laughs>